Let's talk about with Alzheimer's and dementia. I mean, who is it most at risk for this and, and who needs to be concerned about it? Empowering you organically, delivering content you trust with results you love. Hey everyone, Terry Ann Trevenin here, co-host of the podcast, Empowering You Organically, coming at you today solo and excited for our guest today. We have Amazon John Easterling here with us today. Welcome. Uh, good morning, Terry. So good excited morning. to have you here. So let me do a little intro here on John Easterling. Fascinating, fascinating background. Um, we're going to be talking about brain health today, something that John is passionate about. And just to tell you a little bit more about him, since 1976, John Easterling has been an explorer and treasure hunter in the Amazon rainforest. It was there after a personal health crisis, he was introduced to the traditional use of medicinal plants by the indigenous people in Peru. Since then, his passion for plant medicine has only accelerated. His original degree is in environmental studies. He founded the Amazon Herb Company in 1990 and serves on the board of the Amazon Center of Environmental Education and Research. John's 28 years of plant medicine experience have been profiled on TV and radio, including Good Morning America and Fox and Friends. His product formulations have sold over 100 million worldwide. That's a, that's a huge number. John has been featured in two PBS documentaries, World News Reports, and Amazon John and Rainforest Medicines, and John Michael's Castell's re Return to the Amazon. Easterling believes that dramatic growth and interest in plant medicine is still in its early stages and will continue to significantly improve life experiences and healthy outcomes into the future. So I wanna ask you, what in your life brought you to all these amazing um, things that you do now? What was that connection there for you in your life to bring you to where you are at this point? Um, well, Terry, I'm probably the, the, first, the very first connection was a weekly reader we got. I grew up in North Carolina. You get these weekly readers that had a story about a kid your age in another part of the world living. And, and there it was. There was a story in there about a kid in Peru and so I got really fascinated with Peru and, and really developed a, a passion around that, knew that that was part of my future. And it was just a, a dream deferred for many, many years until I got done with school in University of North Carolina and I sold my car and used that money to buy a ticket to Ecuador. Went down to Ecuador and down into uh, Peru with a passion for finding uh, lost cities of gold, essentially a treasure hunter. So I, uh, I spent... Uh, is a, I'm still a treasure hunter. <laughs> you know, that's a very broad definition. Yeah. And I love to use that on applications, you know, the banks for your know, occupation, treasure hunter. And you, I'm sure uh, you get a lot of questions. <laughs> Explain a little yeah. more. You know, that's it's yeah. fascinating, though. But but really, we all are in our life. We're, we're, we're treasure hunters. And for me, it was that. all about uh, uh, Peru. And uh, and we got into some uh, digs down there, some uh, Chimu Moche digs which is pre-inca civilization and i was making my living with uh, some of that material and then uh, uh, some artifacts and then got over into brazil and uruguay and argentina with gemstones and took that on as treasure and then later going up the river in the amazon uh, rainforest i was trading in blow guns and carved monkey bones and a variety of tribal artifacts and i got really uh, uh, sick there it was actually a a kind of a relapse of hepatitis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I'd had a near-death experience with wow. in North Carolina. So I always had a kind of a, a low-grade, uh, a little bit of a low-grade fever. And I would just get these spells where I break out into sweat, almost like malaria, and just have to go down for a day or two. And that was happening in the rainforest. And they just brought a variety of botanicals out and brewed them up into a big tea and you know, I drank it, and but I was eating grilled monkey paws and everything else, so I, and I had no grilled expectation. Grilled monkey paws? Yeah. That's it's, that's pretty wild. Yeah. That's a wild thing. I, well, I've never heard of that. Well, you only do it once. It was like eating a baseball glove. Oh. You know, it's oh. not so easy. Yeah. But, you know, the point is that I noticed my health improve in just a couple of days of drinking these teas. You know, it was Oñe de Gato, Shanka Piedra, some Sangre de Drago, 
And after another three days, I realized, hey, I'm feeling as good now as I was before I was sick. And another couple of days, it was, I'm feeling better now than I've, I've ever felt. And that was a real shock to me. I, I did not have that expectation. I was more grounded, uh, the mental clarity a lot more clear and focused, just because I was introducing things into my body that had never been there before. And it was changing how all my body's organs and glands and systems, and heart, spleen, thymus, lungs, liver, it gave them new nutritional compounds and energetic compounds and informational compounds where they could each of these organs independently could go to a new level of life experience. And I was just the recipient of all that. So ultimately I sold that uh, company, Raiders of the Lost Art, and started Amazon Herb Company. And uh, so then, so that's what, the last 30 years, then the real passion has been all about uh, plant medicine. Yeah. Do you feel like when you're telling your story in my mind, it just I've just painted this picture of like, here you are treasure hunting in one way, and you find a totally different treasure in another way when you look at these ingredients and these things that you've worked with for so long now and how they benefit people. I mean, it, yeah. did it just blindside <clears throat> you that like, here I am doing this and now I found this amazing treasure in a different aspect, a treasure for the body. That's how I yeah. paint it in my head when I hear you talk about it. Yeah, well, you know, it was just, uh, you know, we're all blessed in so many ways. And for me, it was just kind of blind luck, you know, just yeah. uh, uh, blind faith and dumb luck. You know, my whole life, I just kind of pursued what my passion was and then tried to figure out, you know, how do you, how do you make a living doing that? And my, is the treasure I'm finding, is it also valuable to other people? Yeah, sometimes I it was, that. sometimes it wasn't. And so you find that uh, vein where it really benefits. But yeah, the gemstones were interesting because uh, I dealt a lot of tourmaline, amethyst, and, uh, and and quartz crystal, and a variety of mineral specimens, and rhodochrosite and things. And each of those has a specific vibration. So then I was introduced to, to vibration, essentially vibrational medicine, because the density and the molecular structure of, of how anything is made, you know, it will have a, a, a different uh, frequency. If you tap it, you can see that. And so it tied me into learning about in the early days, the culture of Peru and how to uh, engage with indigenous people, either in the highlands or in the rainforest. And then it taught me about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the history, the really deep history. I mean, thousands and thousands of years, you right. go all the way back into the, the Nazca Plains, you can go back 10,000 years, you know, it's way beyond the Inca. And then with the vibrational aspect, it was almost like all that was important before I was introduced to the plants because I was, I was not into plants or any kind of a real healthy lifestyle mode. I was just a driven treasure hunter. So I had to, it seemed like the universe allowed me to have all that background and then show me what the plant medicine, how it could turn my life around. And it really helped me appreciate all of those aspects that we find in botanicals. We find the energetics in botanicals, the frequency in botanicals, the nutrition in botanicals, the, the chemistry, all of that is there. So, um, yeah, you know, you stop and you think about it and, you know, it's uh, it amazes me and yeah. every day and into the future amazes me too. It's a beautiful yeah. story. And I, I really love that you said we're all treasure hunters seeking different types of treasure. I mean, that's really profound for life. And I think in my mind, after learning more about you and, and listening to you, we've had many, you know, calls and meetings with you. I feel like your, you know, your, your treasure for people in the world now and that gift that you're giving to people is improved health, you know, and it's, that's a beautiful thing. Um, we've talked often on our podcast that you just can't put a price on your health. It's, it's what allows you to live a full and beautiful life. So I really, mm -hmm. really love that. So let's talk about how your journey has brought you to brain health specifically, because, um, this is a fascinating topic and something that is coming to the forefront now of everyone's minds. As we talk more about the issues around Alzheimer's and dementia, mm -hmm. tell us how your journey took you to brain health and why you became so passionate about that. Well, you know, in the early 90s, when I was uh, formulated, we're making products for doctors. We made products for, for lots of different things. You know, doctors say, you know, here's a, a, a disease issue or a set of symptomology. Can you design something? So after a while, you got like 45, 50 different things. And then you begin to realize, hey, wait a minute. You know, all four of these things are really about the immune system. 
These things are really about inefficient digestion. This is about inflammatory response. This is about energy. This is about detoxification. So I really saw about eight major areas where everyone is affected and almost every specific challenge falls within that category. So if you just address the eight major issues, you're addressing 90% of really what's out there. So those were kind of the categories and that shifts and change yeah. as the population grows older, as the environmental uh, challenges, you know, shift or change or toxicities. And so currently, yeah, it ends up in the brain. Go, yeah. go over those eight one more time and then let's get to the brain. I just want our listeners to say those in mm -hmm. order again, just so they have that clear. Alphabetical order? Or? In, whatever. <laughs> if you can do it in that way, go for it. Uh, Challenge to you. No, just the eight so that they can hear well, what they be, are. it'd be like the immune system. Okay. Uh, primary digestion, secondary digestion, which would be metabolism, uh, energy circulation, calming and stress-related issues, hormonal balancing, uh, pain, swelling, inflammatory uh, issues, and the last one would be um, uh, got digestion, metabolism, stress, uh, probably probably blood sugar balancing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of yep. stuff that we educate on and very important to the health. I love that list. So let's let's turn our focus to the brain. To the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I find is. Most people will have brains. <laughs> maybe not everyone uses them like we should, or maybe we right. all don't use them as much as we should. Yeah. But the issues with Alzheimer's and dementia, when you look at the statistics, as I've really gotten into more recently, is really shocking, is startling. And I was surprised at a lot of the data that I saw. Um, I just turned 66. And so a lot of this data is mentioning a category of people 65 and over. So I say, hey, well, that's me. And so you look at it, and this I just, I just did not realize. Uh, say heart disease, okay, the biggest uh, killer in America. The incidence of death from heart disease in the last 15 years has actually declined by about 11%. The deaths due to Alzheimer's have increased 123%. Wow. So there's something going on here. And you have uh, people over 65, 1 in 10 have Alzheimer's dementia. and But that affects not just as such a heartbreaking thing for them, but so many other people are personally affected you know, their family and the average have like 5.7 people, kind of uh, non-paid people taking care of this person. So in addition to the health staff and the medical and all of that, you have another uh, five people on average that are non-paid family members or something that are really taking care of these people. And for those people, they're sacrificing income with that time. Many of these people or they call a sandwich generation where they've got kids of their own and they're taking care of maybe their parents at the same time. And then you begin to get stress related issues and things come up with them because it's very difficult, you know, as you know, yeah. when you're dealing with someone with Alzheimer's. It takes dementia. a huge toll. It's a huge cost. It's a huge time um, commitment. Emotionally, it's draining to watch someone go through that. And, you know, I, I do see that becoming more prevalent. Uh, in the world now, and especially in America. And I think the stats on it just speak to the issue that we're seeing with it now. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about with Alzheimer's and dementia. I mean, who is it most at risk for this and, and who needs to be concerned about it? Uh, it's a, it's kind of an aging thing as we all kind of imagine and, and, and uh, perceive it to be. So over 65, you have one out of 10. Uh, deaths of people over 65 years old, one out of three of those deaths will be due to Alzheimer's. It actually, more people are dying of Alzheimer's than prostate cancer and breast cancer combined. So these are things I did not know. I mean, and, and it's getting older because as the baby boomers, that huge you know, belly of the snake, that big group of, of population is coming into that age group now, now that's why you're seeing this really the skyrocket. Go up. Yeah. And the cost is, you know, over two two hundred and seventy billion dollars now. And 
it's expected to go to 1.4 trillion, you know, over the next few years. Huge cost. And the, Huge yeah, the Center cost. of Disease Control said uh, that this could break the entire health system. It's a it's a serious uh, not only health crisis but right. an economic crisis. And like you say, it's an, it's an emotional crisis. It's, it's a heartbreaking thing, but it actually can, you know, break the, the system, just the yeah. cost of it. Yeah, the cost, the, you know, having a place for everyone to go, having people to care for them. I mean, if it continues to grow at this trend, having the resources to adequately take care of someone, which, you know, as we both know, it's, it's a high level of care for someone who's going through this. And so, um, mm-hmm. I mean, those numbers are just almost unbelievable. Just yeah. almost, it's 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 mind blowing. Um, so let's talk about how we're facing this as a society right now, and what we're doing to address this. I mean, not in the sense of what you would recommend people do, but what are we just seeing on average with people handling the issue of Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, you know, as as it comes on, it's kind of you know just it just begins to happen. And it's one thing if you can't find your, your keys a few times or you, you forgot where your phone is. I think that happens to all of us all the time. But when you find your phone in the refrigerator or you find your keys in the dishwasher, you know, then then that can be, you know, uh, really, really get, get your attention. So it begins to uh, come on. How do people deal with it? Well, the current uh, uh, establishment is treating it, you know, pharmaceutically. Of course. And, the, uh, and here's one of the things about that. The, the drugs, the, the most popular drug they're using, uh, one out of five people stop using it. I mean, more than one out of five, more than 20% of people because of the side effects of it. But they're just not that um, effective. And they know it's not that effective. And there's been so much money spent trying to go down this course like 98% of the drugs that start uh, somewhere in the, in the clinical trials or the different phases going through drop out. 98% because A, they just don't work or they've got uh, safety issues. So there's very few drugs in the marketplace and there's always hope for some breakthrough or some new modality. And now people are talking about a potential vaccine or there's always, you know, something going on. There's a lot of sincere, genuine, smart people uh, with a lot of money involved in this. But many of the drug companies have trimmed back their funding for this because they just don't see a way forward. And they're funding <clears throat> research into cancer and some other issues where there are some breakthroughs, there are some progress, there are some good things happening, heart disease, all of these things, uh, they're redirecting. I mean, you know, diabetes, blood sugar control, right. a, lot of, a lot of these other huge issues, they have a much better chance of having a successful uh, outcome for spending their money. And so they've just kind of withdrawn. Right. So this is a, a really big issue. And I think Part of that is because, you know, when you're a drug company, normally you're making an isolate product. You're getting a a molecule that you can patent and uh, go into the marketplace with. And the thing about Alzheimer's is, is I'm really looking at it. You know, my perception of it is, is is multiple uh, factors involved in this. So any single isolate, even if you're addressing one of these or one of these, you really should be addressing uh, all of this stuff. And why do you, let, let's talk about that for a minute in the sense that you said they're really not moving forward. They're not finding anything. Speak to that for a minute. And as far as brain health goes, and as we age, and we already get to the point where we're seeing someone get closer to Alzheimer's or dementia, we're seeing those signs. Speak to that for a minute, not seeing any breakthroughs and moving forward. Speak to the science behind that and why that is, why they're not having breakthroughs when it comes to that. Well, I think it's really getting a grip and understanding the mechanisms and uh, just the, the process of this uh, particular activity, you know, with the Alzheimer's and dementia. So it's kind of commonly uh, accepted uh, that one of these things is happening. You know, it used to be really focused on, uh, you know, a protein, uh, a beta amyloid placking. So you get this placking that occurs in the brain. And then that just interferes with, you know, the neuronal activity, right? So you've got the, the brain, you've got all the signaling. 
cells there and you start at one end and you you know you go through that signal and it puts off a spark across the synaptic cleft the next one picks it up and carries it on so if something's happening in here if you're getting placking in here it's like an old like spark plug when cars used to have spark plugs i guess you still get them in a tractor yep. or a lawnmower way back when yeah <laughs> way back when so Times when you changed. get placking you know your spark plug would foul and you couldn't start your engine so the same thing here, you get that placking in there and it just can't transmit to the next one. And you don't remember, you can't access that data where you put your, where you put your uh, keys. So amyloid placking is, is one issue. Then you've got a thing uh, that's referred to as a tau uh, tangle, where you get the neurons that really just become, you know, tangled. And so you have that same uh, kind of uh, interference. And so then there's uh, just, just inflammation. Inflammation is a really big deal, and actually, these other uh, factors are really caused. It's, it's kind of an inflammatory response from your brain to protect itself sometimes, developing this amyloid placking to seal off what it sees as, a, as an insult, you know, as, a, as something that's insulting that, whether it could be a, a, a virus, bacteria, fungus, yeast, mold, any of these sorts of things. So, um, so there's a multiplicity of things going on there. And the inflammatory part, I think, is really, really big because in an inflammatory state, that's a that's a good biological terrain, you know, for the progression of many pathological processes. Absolutely. So when you address the um, inflammation, you're really addressing uh, so so much of this. And then there's there are some specific things. <laughs> that we can do for, uh, say, the, the amyloid placking and the uh, tau tangles and some of the other uh, things that are going on with that too. And one of those, and this is really uh, surprising, and when you think through it, it really kind of makes perfect sense. And this is some uh, work that just came out last month. I mean, this is brand new. And it's showing the involvement of, uh, of candida in, uh, in, in brain uh, issues. Now, normally people with candida, which is uh, a yeast, um, uh, and it's pretty widespread through the population. Many people have had a yeast or a candida type infection, and it's widespread because most people have done antibiotics or are doing antibiotics, and we've got this candida albicans in our system and our gut, and they reside there and they serve a purpose. However, when you take away the other bacteria and the microbes that are keeping them in check by eating antibiotics, you kill off the other ones, then that really begins to overcolonize, overpopulate, and then it migrates. And women, oftentimes, it's urinary tract infections is, is how it shows up. And men, oftentimes, it's prostate uh, issues. And it's systemic. In other words, it can go through the body. You know, it's in the bloodstream. So this candida is in the bloodstream going everywhere. So what this recent work showed was that people did not think before that the candida could cross a blood-brain barrier. And now they found that it actually can. Wow. And the candida itself actually uh, secretes some amyloid-type placking on its own. And so when that insult... Just as it travels through your body, it's just doing that. It travels it through your body, uh, doing that, looking for a place to reside where you know the biological terrain is, is right and if you introduce a lot of sugar and a lot of carbs into that terrain boy they really love that yeah it's just uh, like an explosion like an explosion yeah. yeah so when these candida cross that blood brain barrier the brain recognizes that as an insult and then you have this coating process the brain will try to coat that to seal it off and it will use this ultimately uh, some of this amyloid beta protein placking to seal that off, right? So it's not an issue anymore. That's part of the inflammatory response that the brain would use for that. But then you've got that placking issue to deal with. And so that's, that makes sense. Why is this so prevalent? And it almost, you could probably, probably chart that and chart maybe the use of antibiotics as the same and the, and the, uh, the, uh, incidents of yeast and, and candida type infections. So we pay particular attention, it seems like, to viruses and bacteria. 
but we're not paying enough attention, I think, to the, to the fungus yeast molds, which I think are equally as hazardous to our health. Yeah. And, you know, in, in you explaining all of that, I think a lot of it comes down to our lifestyle and our health and what we're putting in our body and how we're taking care of our body. Um, that's something that our listeners aren't foreign to. We talk a lot about that and natural health and, uh, you know, all of the toxic things that are out in the environment now, which I'm sure are contributing to all of this and being careful about what you're putting in your body. I think it's so critical. So when you're talking about Alzheimer's and dementia, when you're talking about, um, the placking and things like that, would you say it's safe to say that once you get to the point that you have an Alzheimer's dementia diagnosis at that point it's just maintenance but we do live in a world now where we have enough information we have enough knowledge that it's more about prevention and what we can do to keep that from happening i would say that um yes we want to prevent that from happening and i believe there are things we can do that really make a really big difference from preventing that from happening because you're addressing each one of these uh kinds of uh, normal processes and normal issues. Lifestyle and diet are, are really huge. Um, the, the diet, like we talked about, you know, overeating sugar, overeating antibiotics. If you are, if, if there is something, a specific bacteria that's completely out of control and you have to do an antibiotic, obviously you want antibiotic really specifically geared towards that specific bacteria because a normal person is going to have four to 500 types of bacteria and, and microbials, you know, in their, in the microbiome. And they're all important, you know, with, as long as they maintain a healthy uh, relationship. But if you're doing an antibiotic or you've been on a course of antibiotics, you have to repopulate, you have to recolonize your microbiome with the good bacteria. And I think the broadest diversity of bacteria you can use, the better. I mean, most people are familiar with lactobacillus, a lot of the yogurt type bacteria, but there's so many more, uh, you know, probiotics that you really, I think you should repopulate uh, with as many uh, diverse strains of bacteria because the diversity uh, is, is probably more important than getting, you know, there used to be, you could get like 5 million, you know, colony forming units, and then it was like 50 million and then 100 million. And now it's a billion and five, 5 billion, 10 billion. And there's products with 100 billion, you know, colony forming units of probiotics. But the diversity of those, I think, is really critical. So yeah, lifestyle, you know, if you can uh, avoid as many insults, you know, environmental toxicity, uh, as you can. That's really huge. Huge. You know? And it's everywhere. I mean, you have to be so careful now. So careful. You've got to be careful. And a lot of this, you know, we just can't avoid, yeah. you know, I just arrived on an airplane this morning and, you know, I mean, there was another 340 people on that plane and you could just hear them coughing and wheezing and, yep. you know, that air is recirculating. Bringing germs everywhere. Yeah, yes. I'm, just, I'm looking at the door, you know, I'm thinking, does a seat cushion serve as a parachute? You know, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I'm stuck. I'm there here. for the yep. next three hours. So we have to have our immune system strong as yep. part of that process so that we can defend ourselves from those insults. And then, you know, paying attention to, you know, keeping your body in a, in a proper uh, uh, inflammatory response state. So reducing the inflammatory things that you're putting into your body and on a regular basis. And you can do that. I mean, you can do that with supplementation by keeping your body into a, a non-inflammatory space. And that is really, uh, really big. The other thing is exercise, you know, about lifestyle, uh, because a lot of this is about circulation. If we're not getting the microcirculation to the brain, it's not getting the nutrients that it needs. So as people get older, you know, they're more sedentary. So they're sitting around a lot more and not exercising. So they don't have that fresh blood flow, those fresh nutrients uh, coming in. Yeah, I've been reading a lot of fascinating research recently on exercise and the brain and aging and how important it is. I mean, the research that's coming out now, I mean, it just goes more and more in depth, but it's so critical. And I think sleep too. I mean, I've been reading a lot about sleep and how it impacts our brain health um, over time. And it's so significant. People say, oh, I'll just get a few hours of sleep and I'll be fine. 
But you know, that's something even in my own personal life, I'm trying to improve because of the, the information now that's coming out on how you just can't make up for that lost time in losing the sleep. And it's so critical to take care of our bodies in that way. I agree with you, Terry. So, so strongly on the sleep, it should be, uh, you know, people should be given prescriptions to sleep. You know, yeah. here, you have to sleep nine hours. Yeah. You know, I do best with nine hours. Some people are fine with seven, but you know, nine hours then, and that's a, a time when actually your brain detoxifies. We're talking about the brain health. I mean, your entire body is detoxifying, finding its rhythm again. Including your brain. Including your brain. It's not focused on doing all these things. And now the body can look around and find the areas and really work on the healing, the healing aspect or detoxification because your quiet space, you're not taxing it in any other way. Sleep, you're, you're so right on that. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of things. I loved what you said. We can't avoid all of the toxicity and all of the environmental factors that are going on in the world today, but we can take care of our body. We can do things that really contribute to a healthier mind, healthier body. And, and we talked about, we talked about some of those, um, talk a little bit more about when we talk about what people can do to help their brain um, function better and their overall brain health talk about some specific things you found as far as diet and you know we talk a little bit about supplementation on the podcast and how it can help people with their health Um, but I want to talk about that specifically in relation to the brain because you know we hear a lot of information around supplementation and other aspects of the body but the brain side of supplementation is really coming back to the forefront and what we can do to help our brain benefit from supplementation so talk a little bit more about the diet factor and then the supplementation factor and what's really standing out to you and what can benefit people with the research I, I will, and when I look at uh, uh, botanicals, I look at those as, as food, so it's part of the diet. I mean, the diet and supplementation just kind of overlay on that, and I used to say just eat massive herbage, and uh, and then I like to do that, and you look at my suitcase, you can see I've got all my botanicals there, and then kind of food is, is optional, because these are food. These are like concentrated uh, plant material, it's concentrated food. And a lot of it, especially in the rainforest, is food that you're not going to get around here. Uh, it's grown in a different uh, area, different space, has different chemistry, different energetics, etc. So I look at the food and the supplementation uh, 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 very similarly. But obviously you want to avoid uh, a lot of the, the sugars. You want to be careful about the candida, careful with antibiotic use. You want to be careful about all of those kinds of things. You want to make sure you're getting enough sleep. You want to make sure you're getting enough exercise. And those are really, really big, just all of that. And then when you look at what specific ingredients or what specific chemistry or nutritional factors are going to really uh, facilitate and help some of these causative factors we talked about, things turn up like polyphenols, for example. Polyphenols you find in uh, blueberries and uh, choke berries, you find it uh, in, in berry kingdom like that. We're talking about a diet and eating, and you can find a lot more concentrated polyphenols in something like a camu camu uh, plant. Uh, you get into the anthocyanins and the antioxidant activity, something like a Sangre de Dragos, 90% by dry weight. You, it's a croton lachiri tree, you hit it with a machete, it bleeds as sap, looks just like blood. By dry weight, it's 90% pure proanthocyanin. So that's a really important uh, part of the chemistry you want to be adding to your body. There's a things called a brain-derived neurotropic factors, and this is something that our, our body makes. And there's several uh, botanicals. Uh, Unia de gato uh, really is one cat's claw that helps uh, stimulate uh, the proteins there. That actually uh, initiate a process of neurogenesis. The neurogenesis is where you're building new brain cells or building new cells. In the case of the brain, building new brain cells. And because the brain cells are, are dying all the time and we've got new brain cells coming around all the time, just like every other part of our body. So if you have the ability to build new brain cells in a more substantial way, uh, and we can, I mean, one, I think one part of 
if your question was inferring we hit a plateau and we've been diagnosed, maybe we're looking to maintain, uh, I would suggest that we can do a lot more than maintain, that I think we can actually, uh, we're in a position where we can actually have the neurogenesis, we're rebuilding new brain cells that affect memory and learning, and also slow down the process, they call it an apoptosis of normal cells, where cells go through a lifespan, they die, new ones are being born. Right. You can actually preserve the cells that are already there in a healthy state. So if you're helping preserve those and slow down that apoptosis, uh, then and you're building new brain cells, then you're actually you know growing white matter in your memory and your uh, uh, focus, concentration, cognitive abilities can actually be improving. And the cool thing about that is you have something like as simple as a cacao. You know, cacao can slow down the process of, of brain cells dying. You know, there's chemistry in the cacao that does that. There's epicatechins in that. There's epicatechins in uh, cat's claw. Resveratrol is another one that's very significant here. And you find that in uh, the camu. Uh, camu. There's um, the uh, in cinnamon, uh, cinnamon dalahide, which has been shown to slow down, to break down amyloid placking and help dissolve these tau uh, uh, tangles. Amino acids, leucine, valine, serine. Now these are in camu camu. That that's really interesting because some of the new data is showing those have the ability to break up this uh, tau tangles. And every one of these things I mentioned are also very anti-inflammatory. So if you can create a, a non-inflammatory terrain uh, in the brain and you have a proper immune system and have enough antioxidants in your body, uh, then it's going to be neutralizing you know, the causes of these things uh, as, as you go forward. And because you're building uh, more brain cells and you're, you're breaking down that amyloid placking and dissolving the tau uh, tangles, and if you can eliminate that candida um, as well, so some antifungal uh, activity there, you're, you're uh, way ahead. I love it. There's so many things rolling around in my head right now. The first thing is, this is fascinating. The first thing is you touched on uh, what you're putting into your body. So just your overall diet and just some of those ingredients you talked about you're working with some of those on a supplementation level. So a more concentrated amount of those from a supplementation standpoint, but just imagine keeping some of these things in our everyday diet and how that's going to impact you. That's why we need the healthy diet. That's why we need to be worried about what we're putting into our body. Then you take it to a supplementation level and you're taking some of these ingredients. And this is where this ties back to the beginning part of the podcast, where we talk about your story. You know, you've been introduced to, the diet side of things on your adventures and your journeys at your journey through your story and treasure hunting and finding these amazing ingredients. And now you're looking at research behind how they impact the brain. And so supplementation is so critical now when it comes to the brain and what we can do to have a healthy brain um, and better brain function overall. And I love what you said. You believe with Alzheimer's and dementia, it's not only about maintenance, and prevention, but also some reversal there from what I'm hearing you say and, and mm -hmm. getting back to a healthier state with your brain even once you've had that diagnosis happen. Let me ask you a question about that. So the placking and the tingling, when are we starting to see more and more of that? If this is becoming more prevalent and the trend is going up, clearly we're watching this in the brain and when this is happening. And at what point are we seeing this more and more as people age? Because I don't think it just you know turns on like a light bulb and one day you have this issue happening and you're not taking care of it. When are we starting to see this more and more as people age? When is it really becoming a problem before it becomes an even bigger problem? If you look at the stats, it seems to be around 65 uh, so say there's 5.7 million people with Alzheimer's that are over 65 and there's 200,000 with Alzheimer's that are less than 60. Okay. So it seems like that's a, that's a threshold. Mm -hmm. So whether that is the threshold where we've accumulated enough toxicity or the threshold where we're not as active as we used to be, the threshold, all these things we talk about diet and lifestyle kind of begin to shift at that point. And so uh, then, then you really see that, that rise. Or not taking care of the immune system, you're not doing all the things 
that we talked about, you know, really paying attention to the inflammatory state of your body and your immune health and the and your microbiome. All these are real, really critical uh, factors. So age, you know, it seems to be very age related. I mean, you hit you hit in this category and it really starts uh, 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 moving in a significant way. And it's one, I think at 80, uh, then you get like one out of two people or 85. Every other person's got Alzheimer's. I mean, that's that's, it's staggering. Yeah, that's gigantic. It's a huge yeah. number. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, just because it's, uh, you know, it, it looks like, okay, that's normal. But just because that's really common doesn't mean it's normal, you know, at all. In other words, I think that I really believe there are things that we can do about that. Yeah, that's the common, but we don't accept that. Okay, that's going to happen. No, no. The idea is that uh, that's that's not normal, and and we can uh, change that. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think we look at it as normal now. Well, we there's just a chance I'm going to get Alzheimer's. There's just a chance I'm going to have dementia. And I don't think we allow that to become normal. And I think this whole conversation speaks to that and taking care of our bodies and what we can do as far as diet, supplementation, exercise, and sleep. So, you know, to close this out today, the last thing I want to touch on is for people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, we've already talked about things you can do, but how important is supplementation? And some of those ingredients you're working with specifically where we're seeing a huge impact on brain health. How important is that in your mind? Well, you know, you're asking Amazon John, so you know what that answer is <laughs> going to be. I think I think it's critical. I think it's just absolutely critical. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, I'm just, we can only speak from our own life experience. But I know the, the issues I had that were, you know, hepatitis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And when I came out of that, uh, that near-death experience, and I just recovered like 60%. And that's just, I couldn't get back all the way to where I was. And the doctors told me, well, that's normal. You're lucky to be alive. And at that point in my life, I said, okay, I accepted that. And so many people accept that, where they're in a compromised place early on. But once I had my experience in the rainforest and realized, you know, two weeks later, I'm back to being in better health than I had ever been, I realized, wait a minute, that's not actually the way it works. So when you're talking about the diet, you know, we have in uh, America, there's, uh, you know, just a, a couple of hundred things that we eat pretty much all the time. So when we, and that's the way we shop for food. You know, we, we look in the cupboard, well, gee, I'm out of this, I'm out of this, I'm making a list, right? Here's the list. And you're just replacing the same things you've over been eating over, all yeah. the time yep. over and over, right? And that's a limited sphere because in the rainforest, there's 100,000 species of plants. So now the guys in the rainforest are eating an average of 2,500 different plants during the course of Amazing. the year. Amazing. So if you it, think about the standard diet in America and you compare it to that, you're absolutely right. It's just recycling over and over again. <laughs> all these things yeah. that are out there that we're never exposed to, our bodies are never exposed to. So you want to reach beyond the cupboard, you know, of that and reach into this huge uh, natural pharmacy treasure house of the rainforest. I mean, this is my idea where you've got 100,000 plants. And so for them, they don't make a list because they don't have a cupboard to start with. Right. So they just go out into the forest and whatever's in season or whatever fruits are, that's what they're eating. So they're eating, you know, normally, I mean, the further up river you go. Uh, you know, you're, they're eating fresh fruit, whatever's in season, and and they're hungry. So, I mean, they're extending that into, you know, the barks and the roots and leaves and stems. And they're getting this really broad spectrum of chemistry, of nutritional factors, of energetics. And, and the further up river you go, you don't see the degenerative issues, cancer, arthritis, diabetes. Those just really fade off. As soon as you introduce sugar, refined sugar and and bread, and they start getting the, start as soon as their the diet issues. changes, their teeth rot out, they get diabetes, they have all the other issues anyone else does. It's just part of our organism. So yeah, reach beyond uh, the cupboard, you know, find some things because your organs and glands and systems will appreciate it. They can only do what the raw what raw material they have available. You know, if you're going to build a house, you can't build it with just nails. 
right? You need the lumber, you need the mortar, you need the brick, you need the piping, you need all of that. So the more tools you give these organs, the broader spectrum diversity uh, of chemistry, nutrition, and energetics, the more they can, they'll automatically do it. You know, they're just waiting to do it. Yeah. They're saying, where has this stuff just been my whole tools. life? Wow, yes. look what I can do Giving now. the tools, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's so important for people to understand and really take in where you talk about going up river and the further up you go, the more plants and species they're exposed to and they're going with the seasons and what's in season. And I think that's something, it's something we've lost in our diet because it's, we go to the store, we restock, we restock, we restock. And here's these people where they're living proof of being out in nature, being exposed to a natural plant, eating it, you know, in its natural form, in season, going through all these different species. And they're not seeing these issues. I think that's so yeah. important for people to realize. And I love this movement that I hear of people bringing gardens back and having gardens in their backyard and eating natural and organic and supplementation. People really have to grasp on to this concept of, you know, food is our medicine. And this mm -hmm. is why people who are all the way up river, they're not seeing these issues, which is fascinating. And at the same time, it's really not fascinating in the sense that it's just normal. When you talk about, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia becoming normal, it's not normal. People who are living a healthy life and really taking care of their bodies, this is not normal for them. They're living long, healthy, beautiful lives. That's what normal is. And I think we've lost that. We've lost yeah, exactly. that in our culture and our society. Well, so... Um, I've loved this. I've absolutely loved this. And it's been very enlightening for me. We're excited um, to be doing another podcast with you. So tune in for that one next week as well. Not only has this been fascinating, but we're going to expand on what we've talked about here, really dive into some of the ingredients that you've been specializing in and doing research around and how they can impact the brain, what they're doing to support brain health and talk more about your journey and finding these treasures, which I absolutely love. So thank you for being here today. I mean, this has been absolutely enlightening for me and I definitely appreciate it. Um, for those who are listening in, you can check out all our podcasts and this podcast at empoweringyouorganically.com. We are also on iTunes, so you can check us out there. Again, John Easterling, thank you for being here, and we're looking forward to having you back again next week. Thanks, Terry. Be happy to Thanks, be here. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.